Hello, and welcome to the stream. I'm Super Hogwild. Going to be once again running some commodities around the Sea of Thieves. This is uh, run number 30, and it is February 19th, 2023. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Uh, last stream, run number 29, was the sleep deprivation edition of uh, these videos. This is going to be the super sleep deprivation edition. Uh, I was almost going to take the night off again. I probably shouldn't be out here doing this. We'll see how it goes. Rather than the uh, super sleep deprivation edition, it's probably going to be the no content edition. We'll see. These streams usually go over five hours. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, welcome to the stream. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, the algorithm has found me a bit of an audience. We uh, are well over 100 watch hours now, so... Hey, I do my best. I try to make this as entertaining as possible. It's a bit of a hybrid format. Going to be sailing around delivering the crates, of course. Uh, new to the format, I uh, shoot fireworks at any ships I see, trying to antagonize them. Or uh, sometimes I make some friends, too. You never know. You never know what happens. And, of course, between all the exciting action, I'm going to be, uh, I don't know, ranting and raving, talking about whatever. I try to do a bit of current events, a bit of whatever media I'm watching. Of course, since these things go over five hours, the longer they go on, the stranger they get. Sometimes we talk about uh, esoteric magic, whether or not you're into it. I got uh, things to say about it, let me tell you. Uh, I make a lot of jokes, a lot of jokes about reptilian aliens. Jokes only, of course, because we don't believe in them. They don't exist. They are not real. You don't have to worry about them, okay? Well, we'll see how things go tonight, because, uh, like I said, I'm just, Visit I'm absolutely, again, uh... I'm just flat. I'm flat, flat on it right now. Um, I tried to uh, try to get some some new shows to watch. No luck. Uh, I'm talking about that uh, Kevin can f himself show. That's on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's recommended by Mike from Red Letter Media. Usually, uh, like I said, I don't always agree with what they have to say about shows, but usually their recommendations are good enough. I think maybe his deal was, though, is he didn't watch enough episodes of it because here's the deal with this Kevin Can F Himself show. If you've never heard of it, I certainly haven't. Uh, it's, about, uh, it's about a lady uh, played by, uh, I think her name is Annie Murphy. She's a good actress anyways. She's uh, married to a guy, and every time the guy is, on, uh, is in a scene in this show, it's portrayed like a sitcom, okay? But then every time he leaves the scene, it goes back to uh, kind of like a dark HBO drama. Now, because half of the show is a hammy sitcom with this guy every time he shows up, it's a really neat effect. It certainly gets you watching. Um, I thought that the show would be like a dark comedy, okay? I got eight episodes into this show at 40 minutes per episode. It's not, it's not a comedy, folks. It's not a comedy. Can you... I honestly, it almost makes me angry how bad that show is because it took me eight episodes to figure it out. But every episode, it just gets darker and darker until you're on episode eight and you realize that, like, there's no jokes here. It's, it's not a comedy show. Half the show is portrayed like a literal uh, sitcom, like uh, King of Queens or something, right? With a laugh track and everything all brightly lit. And then the other half of the show is like they're trying to be one of the darkest, moodiest shows I've ever seen on Amazon Prime or anywhere else. And it is so jarring that um, it was making me feel physically ill for the first few episodes there till I was talking about it in a previous stream. I realized that uh, what I was feeling was cringe because you, you feel really embarrassed for the people in the show given their situation. I mean, you got this guy who literally acts like a sitcom character and then you can't help but imagine him as a real guy, so that makes you cringe. But by the time I got to the eighth episode, I'm just cringing because I can't believe that this show even ever got made. It's a uh, it, hilariously bad idea that you would try to make a, a serious drama and then portray half of the show as a sitcom with a laugh track, which isn't really funny because it's like a, like a parody of a sitcom. So, you know, I wish I had some good things to say about it. I uh, wish I could recommend it. I absolutely don't. Maybe check out one episode or whatever, but this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying about this episode. Usually I got, like, show notes and stuff. I just do this as a hobby, but I try to put a little bit of effort into it. But uh, today, who knows? Who knows how things are going to go? I'm still going to get out here. We're going to shoot some fireworks. I'm going to try to have some fun because I do enjoy doing these regardless, but... I'll tell you. As for current events, as for media, yeah. I mean, there's not really a whole lot going on to talk about there either. 
I uh, was talking about uh, Doomers on Reddit last stream. <laughs> Ranting and raving a little bit about that. What can you do? What can you do? It's like, you know, I try to go on there to, to browse, try to find some things to talk about, try to find some news media, and you go into the comments and it's just like, it's just a garbage pile. It's just a big sludge heap. So I'm going to try to uh, gonna try to stay away from that topic this stream. We'll see how things go. As for the fire uh, firework crate we're going to pick, I'm going to try this Villainous Foes one. The only two we haven't tried yet are these Athena's Fortune and Villainous Foes. You know what? I actually changed my mind. I'm going to go with the Athena's Fortune one. We'll do the Villainous Foes last. I do try to, uh, to make friends with people using these fireworks. And by make friends, I mean um, I shoot them right over the deck of their ship and they get incredibly spooked thinking that... Somebody's come to knock down their master, fill them full of cannonballs while they're sitting in port, and they usually set sail and retreat immediately. But sometimes, sometimes they shoot fireworks back and we have a good time, so we'll see how things go. You can see that uh, I finally got that dark adventurer paint on the ship. We make about um, just over 400,000 usually on an average run here, so. That's what a Sea of Thieves ship with 16 million coin worth of cosmetics looks like. It's uh, the two most expensive cosmetic uh, paint jobs you can put on the ship. The Dark Adventurer sails, which everybody recognizes. And then I've got that Dark Adventurer hull paint now. Both of which are worth uh, 8 million coin. So there you go. Good stuff. I was going to check and see if I could change the crest on that as well. Change it to, uh, change it to a red. But I'm not sure if that's something that I do have. I think that's under decoration. Ship's crest. Yeah, one of these. That's Gold Seeker. Ooh, this would look good. This actually goes with the Dark Adventurer set. It's uh, red skulls and black. So, Shark. Lurking Terror. Siren's Call. Or the uh, Faded Skull. None of them are really appropriate, but hey, there you go. Let's see how that looks. That's snazzier. Doesn't really match the cannons, though. I've been talking about maybe switching the cannons out. Yeah, you know, I just don't think the Red Skulls, I don't think they're my style. They certainly go with the Dark Adventure gear, but I'm going to stick with the blue because the blue goes with the flag. I'll, uh, I'll continue to think about that. I just don't think the look necessarily uh, necessarily works. Could go with uh, one of these ill-fated purple crests. Those are always funny. I've got the ill-fated title on the ship because I think it's funny when people are chasing me around that I've got the title on for uh, being sunk. <laughs> Even though I've only got uh, seven sinks on this ship, I always show off the statistics. 13 million gold earned, seven sinks. Each one of those sinks uh, is in an episode. So if you do want to see me sink, you can go check that out. Um, I've been kegged twice. Usually what happens is uh, I'll get blasted in port. I've never actually... Uh, let me see how many times. I've been successfully uh, boarded twice. And only one time, it ended in disaster. But we parlayed and I got to keep my loot, so that didn't count as a sink. But let's see, we got the fireworks. Gonna get some supplies. Like I said, I'm a little bit brain dead. A little bit brain dead today. I'm listening. It's always these episodes uh, where I was going to take the night off and I end up coming out here sailing anyways. They always tend to work out the best for whatever reason. I am, of course, streaming this live on Twitch, so we'll see who comes in. We got a couple of regulars. There's always new people stopping by as well. It's an open chat situation, so, you know, if you do catch these videos on YouTube, don't forget to... Yeah, I'm not going to... I'm, I'm not going to beat you over the head with it, but it does help the search algorithm brings in more people when you like and subscribe. But what I was going to say, if you do decide to come by here, you can check out the live show when I am broadcasting. Uh, the schedules are, uh, are posted on the Twitch site, but usually it's um, 9 p.m. Eastern every day, except, except Mondays. Mondays and Thursdays I take off. Sundays I always said were a maybe. I've done them uh, every time so far, but... I might have to. Uh, I might have to take off the Sundays. We'll see. I really enjoy doing these, but just with my work schedule and my personal life, uh, you know, I don't want to run myself completely dry. Completely dry and dead. I've been joking that one day, you know, eventually, if I keep doing these into the summer, you're gonna come in and I'm gonna look like a withered black skeleton with smoke coming off of me, and that's that's gonna be my final form doing these. 
Gonna pull this ship into position, get this harpoon going. Get these goods loaded up as quickly as possible. Oh, also, yeah, haha. It's Sunday, so I will have to check the commodity book and update my list here to see uh, what it is we're gonna be selling at each port. You don't really want to sit around with your anchor down in this game. <laughs> Learned that last stream. Had a uh, wonderful near miss. Was that last stream? No, that was Friday's stream. Predicted somebody coming around a blind corner like this only was over at Ancient Spire, but managed to shoot him off the ladder with the blunderbuss. Got a little bit of action in there. Everything worked out. Good shot. There's going to be lots of good shots in this stream. I'm seriously practically cross-eyed at this point uh, because of my, my lack of sleep. Didn't, uh, didn't eat breakfast, but I got, uh, got some other good meals in during the day, so, I mean, hey, you know, what can you do? Sometimes you just gotta get out on the open waters, do the best you can, see how things work out. As long as I keep my eye on the horizon, things should be alright. These streams usually go pretty good. Only had one disaster in the last ten. Not sure if it's because of the Dark Adventure cosmetics, if that's scaring everybody off or what, but whatever it is, things have been going good. I've been talking about how I've kind of wanted to see a little more action. I thought I'd be able to cut more chase highlights and whatnot, but uh, I've seemed to have had two good luck, so if anybody knows a way to, uh, to turn a man's luck around, let me know. Leave a comment. I was thinking about maybe I could hang a horseshoe the wrong way around. I could smash some mirrors, but I feel like that's a waste of a good mirror. Don't want to, uh, don't want to smash a mirror for no reason, you know? It's tough to find a good mirror sometimes. Beautiful shot with the harpoon. This is just going to be an absolute, uh, just an absolute garbage pile. We'll see how things go. We'll see how things go. Hopefully I don't have to fight off too many borders. Now that the goods are loaded up, get this heading out just a little bit into the sea in case somebody does swing around the corner. Probably not that likely, but it was funny at the start of last stream. I went in to buy the Dark Adventure hull paint and I came out. And my ship was gone. Somebody else's ship was in the, in the place. But I, uh, I talked to the guy. Who was his friend? His friend took it. I managed to get it back. Everything was good. Made for a Good intro. A good start to, uh, I don't know, pretty good stream. I think it went pretty good. Pretty good on Saturday. Considering how long these things are and how many of them I do, though, they uh, they all blend together and I can't seem to remember half of what happened or went on. Okay, so what am I, what, what am I doing here? Hog Wild, man, figure it out. Okay, Merchant Alliance book, this is a course where you figure out what's sought after, what's in surplus. I buy everything though, so the surplus isn't that big of a deal, but it is useful. If you do skip ports, sometimes it's good to know. So Sanctuary is going to be tea and silks. New Golden Sands is going to be sugar and gemstones. Ancient Isles is going to be Wonder Outpost, Gemstones, and Stone. Yeah, I joked yesterday I was operating on three brain cells. Well, folks, I'm operating on one and a half today, so. So this is certainly going to be great. Just, just, just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful voyage. Spices and minerals at Ancient Spire. That is, of course, not a dog that just urinated on the dock. That is um, actually a commodity box. We're all collectively hallucinating right now in this moment. So be careful. Be careful uh, Be careful what you see, what you think you see. You never know. Can't always trust your eyes in this crazy world we live in. The wilds. That's what I'm looking for. Dagger tooth, minerals and spices. Galleon's Grave, Stone, and Sugar. Seems like everything's in order. And 
and last, but certainly not least, Devil's Roar, my favorite outpost here. Silk Santee. Okay. Okay, that looks good. That looks good. I'll just save that, and we will be on our way. With or without me in the ship, it seems. The old Falcon has a mind of its own tonight. Would be nice if I could just sit in the back, have a nap, and it would deliver the com commodities for me. Not a dog would just carry the crates in and out. Let me see whether or not we're going to go uh, clockwise, counterclockwise here. Spices to spices, silks to silks, stone to stone, minerals to... That's a miss, tea to... That's a miss. Sugar, that's a miss. Looks like it's, uh, you know... Six of one, half a dozen of the other here. But gemstones, that's also a miss. So it looks like we're going to go from plunder to golden sands, which is clockwise. So it's going to be the opposite from what it was last week. Mixing it up. I've noticed it tends to flip one way or the other. If it goes clockwise one week, it'll go counterclockwise the other week. Wasn't the case last week, though. Stayed the same, but. It was also quite close. Usually seems to be uh, four one way, three the other, three one way, four the other. And of course, in order to choose which direction I'm going to head in, it's all about getting rid of the uh, the most crates before your final checkout. So you want to sell them as early as possible in the route when you pick them up. That way it also makes sure that if you do get sunk, you run into some trouble out here, you'll be able to make the most profit as quickly as possible. And uh, that's one of the nice things about doing these commodities. If you do play Sea of Thieves and you'd like to come out here and make a little bit of money running these commodities, it's not a bad idea because unlike most other voyages, you're making money the whole way around. So when you do get sunk, even though you lose that final checkout on deck, which uh, sometimes is worth 60 to 80,000 coins for that final sale, you're not going to be missing out on uh, making a profit because you'll have already sold a lot of commodities before then. Hmm. So, 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 this is it. Back out on the open seas. Yeah, talking about that Kevin can F himself show. That whole show can go F itself. I cannot honestly believe that they would make a show like that. I'm going to try not to rant and rave about it too much here because it's just like, you know, whatever. It's a bad show. We all get it. But I uh, actually do highly recommend that if you do have Amazon Prime and you want to check out an absolute train wreck of a concept, go watch the first episode and you'll see exactly what I mean. It just seems like uh, just seems like a real wasted waste of an idea. It would have been great had there been... I thought, like I said, I thought it was going to be a dark comedy. It's not a dark comedy. There isn't, there isn't really a single joke in uh, in eight episodes. I thought maybe I was just kind of in a weird mood watching it because I was like, you know, right? It's got to be a comedy. Half the show is literally a sitcom. But then, uh, no, no. I think also the problem was too. I mean, it'd be one thing if it just, uh, if it wasn't, you know, full of jokes and clownery. Uh, outside of the, the sitcom portions of it, but then, like, it's not only not a comedy, it's ultra dark. Just ultra dark and disgusting. It's like they were trying to make the most serious drama possible outside of the sitcom parts. And the novelty of it is kind of alright for a few episodes, because it, it does kind of make you laugh. And it is a neat little effect that they do there. But at the same time, it's like... It's like, uh, it's jarring, and then it's confusing. Because on the one hand, you got a guy who's literally a sitcom character. But then you have uh, a drama around this, uh, the character, the wife, where she's just uh, sick and tired of living with this guy who's a sitcom character. But he's such a sitcom character that it's like, and I, and I mean that literally, literally a character from a sitcom. That y you just like, 
you can't really relate to her problems at all. It doesn't work as a drama because it's like there's nobody in the world who is that stupid and acts like that big of a buffoon. And then when he does act like a buffoon, you're actually more on the the, the side of the Kevin character because he actually comes across as uh, you know kind of a lovable uh, a lovable buffoon buffoon idiot dude. Like he doesn't seem like he really means anybody any harm. Because he's just like a happy-go-lucky sitcom dude, right? And it's like, yeah, if that was a real guy, and some parts of his character were different, then it'd be like, okay, well, that's too bad. So really, like, the main character, the the girl played by Annie Murphy, really comes across as, like, incredibly un unlikable, really, when it comes down to it. And she's supposed to be the character that you're supposed to sympathize with. But, like, another thing in the show, too, and I talked about that before, is, like, she has no friends and everybody in her town hates her. And it's never really explained why everybody's such a jerk to her, but it's like... You kind of, like, start out the show feeling really bad for that character because it's like, well, you know, that'd be a horrible life to live. But then as the show goes on, it's like there's really no redeemable qualities about her. So it's like, yeah, no wonder nobody likes this woman. Like, she's not a nice person to anybody. It's just like, it is just so absolutely mind-blowing that they made this show, and I feel like every episode I, I watched gave me, like, brain damage or something. And I'm, like, controversial statement, okay, but it's like, it messes with your head when you see, like, oh yeah, it's a sitcom, and then it's not, and it's like, you can't make half your show a sitcom, and then the other half, like, the, the, a dark, serious drama about, like, I don't know what the undertones is it supposed to be about like spousal abuse or something like I have absolutely no idea I have no idea what they're trying to do with it so anyways that's that that's what's on my mind besides that I mean I was talking about uh, I saw Hook 1991 great movie go see it absolutely uh, just an acid trip like I said the best way to uh, watch that movie it got mixed reviews got a bit of a cult following now in this day I didn't like it the first time I saw it but Go watch that if you want to see something something entertaining, but my opinion to watch that is treat it like an R-rated Peter Pan movie. Just imagine it as just a little bit further than it goes. It is uh, PG-13, but like, I don't know. Steven Spielberg said he didn't like the tone of it. I don't know if he meant because it was too dark or too light, but I feel like if they would have went like a little darker with it, it would have been... Uh, it would have been even better, but it's it's like pretty dark as it is. And I don't know whether that's on purpose or not, but it works. Absolutely works. And uh, also, talking about Hail Caesar. That was a Coen Brothers movie, so that's also on Amazon Prime. Hook and Hail Caesar are both on Amazon Prime. So if you haven't seen either of those, those are great. A couple of great watches. And, like, I'm not a Peter Pan fan or a Disney fan by any means. I really don't like Disney. I feel like everything they've ever touched, especially lately, has uh, turned to absolute trash. I think it would be hilarious if they did decide to make, like, because they've made, like, a live-action, uh, live-action Lion King. They've made a live-action Aladdin. They've made a live-action uh, Mulan. They're making all these live-action movies. Go make a, a live-action Peter Pan. I mean, they kind of did it with Hook, but, of course, the story of that is uh, you got Robin Williams playing an adult Peter Pan, and it's, like, uh, this weird continuation of the story. But uh, if they were to actually just straight up make a, a live-action Peter Pan and the way they've done the live-action Aladdin and all that, oh man, that would be absolutely wild. Because the whole idea, right, of this uh, this kid flying around killing grown men with swords, it's just like, when you see it in live-action, you realize how absolutely insane and like, it's almost like a, like a nightmare. It's just ridiculous. But it's good. It's a good movie. And, uh, Hail Caesar, that's great. So, check those out. I'm not going to, uh, you know, take a big steaming, steaming pile on, uh, on a show here without recommending something, something good. But those are, those are both good shows. So besides that, I mean, uh, you know, tried to find some other content here. Usually I put in a little effort for at least the first hour or two, but... Saw a video on uh, on Reddit. What we got here. That's a weird bunch of loot. 
couple barrels look like a storage crate. Storage crates aren't really worth anything. Yeah, I saw on Reddit there's a video of a deer with another deer's head stuck to it in the antlers. Uh, content warning. It's absolutely insane. But if you want to see something crazy, there you go. Go look that up. I also saw this video of a, of a dead bird uh, floating above some power lines with absolutely no context or explanation and apparently there was a couple of people a couple of people who saw it and took pictures of it and I'm that just I'm sorry to even bring your attention to it to be honest because that's just frustrating in this day and age where it's like really you're gonna just post a video of a floating bird in the sky with absolutely no other context and we're not gonna get the rest of that story so um I'll try to uh, I'll try to like get an update on that at some point I guess. Tune into future streams to uh, to see that one. I have no idea what it's about. I have absolutely no idea what it's about. And of course, you go into the comments and somebody's like, "Oh, is it stuck in maybe in a magnetic field above the power lines?" And it's like that's not a that's not a thing. Like birds aren't magnetic, and power lines don't like create magnetic fields. I mean, there's electricity flowing through them, but I would imagine because it's uh, an alternating current, not a direct current. If you get a direct current, it creates like a spinning magnetic field, which is like super cool. I'm always uh, always looking up uh, those science videos about magnetic fields. That stuff is trippy. Thinking about like photons. Any kind of electromagnetic energy in general is uh, super cool because it's all sort of the same. It's all sort of the same stuff, but we don't understand it. That whole connection between electricity and magnetism. We sort of understand it, but it's one of those things, of course, where it's like, you know, how much how much can you really understand about just like a fundamental uh, law of physics besides the fact that it's like, you know, it's just uh, something that exists. So we got a sloop. We got a sloop out there. Poseidon's disgrace that appeared, captain by the Phantom BEI. That's 99% uh, chance of being hostile. I always try to figure out if people are going to be hostile or not based on their names. Usually everybody who runs that feared tag, they're going to be hostile. So we'll see. We'll see what he does. I'm still going to pull in here. If he comes my way, then I'll sail up wind a little bit. We had another 40-minute sloop chase at the end of last night's stream. Just can't stand him because the whole thing is, like, if you're in a sloop, one of these small one mass ships, and another sloop tries to chase you around, any player... Oh... Goldsman's here. Goldsman says, yo, I just want to let you know that today Gold Hoarders has a double bonus going on. I know you like your merchant stuff. Maybe that would interest you. Yeah, that's all right. I make enough money. Um, the uh, merchants are going to be getting a, a bonus next week. Hope it's not on uh, one of my days off. But thanks for that info, Goldsman. Really appreciate that. That would actually be funny if I just uh, bought the Gold Hoarders uh, emissary and just did Gold Hoarder stuff today and still posted it under the uh, the commodity run. Title. People would come and be like, "These aren't commodities. He's running. He's running treasure chests and stuff." I'm actually thinking about it. I'm just beyond sleep deprived in this stream. I shouldn't even be here. I shouldn't even be doing this. Said so this is the no content edition of the stream. Anyways, had a sloop chase last night. That was really dumb. Because uh, you know, if you're in a sloop and somebody tries to chase you in a sloop, there's no way that they can catch you. But there's also no way that you can like get far enough away so they'll stop chasing you so it just turns into like this slow motion chase around the sea of thieves that just goes on until one person just decides that uh, it's stupid and gives up goldsman says to pirates gold is the most precious commodity there is that's what i should be doing i should be sailing gold and silver around never mind box full of broken stone what is this nonsense so we're here at uh, golden sands 29 minutes into this journey. I'm gonna be selling this one crate of raw sugar. Uh, I'm actually gonna hold on to that. I'll wait for the second loop around before I sell that. Oh, you're just in time to help us. I'm always just in time to help, aren't I? Never late, never early. Sometimes early, a little bit early. Recently. These commodities respawn every five days. So you can catch the wind, or if you can find a way to load them up quick. I've managed to uh, shave a couple minutes off these runs each port. Going. And I actually have been sailing in early because of that. One big thing that helps 
don't organize the boxes till you're already sailing. So that's that. That is that. And that is also that. I mean, it's it's interesting that, you know, trying to browse Reddit, trying to find some uh, some content, some things to talk about for this stream, and it's just like, yeah, a deer with another deer's head stuck to it, caught in its antlers. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's all we got. That's all we got. Maybe I should have just taken the night off. I was just going to, like, uh, meditate for five hours instead of this, you know? Goldman says, oh, I hate that picture. Yeah, it's actually, uh, they got a video of it. It's just like... It's just like it is what it is, man. Goldsman says it's sad as hell. That deer seems to be having a good time. Just the fact he, like, doesn't even care. But it's like, yeah, I kind of wish they would have, uh, maybe separated. Separated it. But... I don't know. One of these commodity crates is, uh, howling, I think. I might be hallucinating. Weird. But yeah, that's uh, that's deer for you. They're always like smashing antlers. I guess eventually uh, what'll happen? What'll happen is his antlers will fall off because they shed their antlers every year. So I mean, eventually, uh, eventually he'll deal with it naturally. Come spring, it'll sort itself out. I saw a picture one time of uh, it was three deer stuck together. Their antlers got stuck. And they drowned in a palm, a pond rather. That was crazy. Goldsman says I like meat, but I don't like seeing things like that happen to animals. Yeah, it. Uh, I don't know. It is what it is. I mean, the whole thing about animals and uh, nature is that I don't think that there's any deer out there that die of old age, seeing the way that uh, predators and prey go. It's just sort of the way they live. They have uh, certainly a different outlook on life and things, you know? They're unfazed. They're unfazed by the complete insanity of it all, living in nature. At least when you're a deer, you know who your enemies are. You know who your friends are and you know who your enemies are. Deer are probably your friends. I guess they smash antlers though, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know a lot about deer. They come through my neighborhood all the time. Oh yeah, Goldman says just seeing how its head was like that just really makes me feel bad for it because that wasn't a quick way to go. Might have broke its neck. Died instantly. I don't know how, like, for real, that's something I didn't even think about is like, how did its head get separated? Because usually what happens like that apparently happens all the time where their antlers get locked like that and I think in most cases they just both end up perishing um, saw a video of a park ranger one time what they'll do is they'll, uh, they'll blast the antlers with a gun to separate them that's like that's a pretty crazy shot to make but they do it so I saw a, uh, a video of that one time but yeah yeah that's just uh, that's just the way they are you know too bad we didn't live in a perfect world where deer didn't fight. But I guess it's part of their part of their deer thing. The whole um what do you call that? They fight for uh, like dominance and supremacy. That's why it's funny, you know, talking about doomers on Reddit. How they're always uh they always got bad things to say. They generalize like the entirety of the human race all the time where You'll see, you'll see some video of something and they're just like, oh, people are the worst. We should all just disappear forever. And a lot of the things too is it's where it's like, oh, we don't, uh, we don't take care of our environment and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, neither really do animals if you think about it. Cause like deer will overpopulate and just like eat out the entire, uh, the entire ecosystem if there's too many of them. They're actually practically a vermin. That's why there is open hunting season on them in a lot of places. Majestic animals, I don't hunt myself. They uh, come through my neighborhood, I just like to stare at them. Watch them eat people's shrubs and stuff. Goldsman says if an animal dies quickly, I'll feel a bit bad for it, but not horribly for it. 
I just don't like seeing stuff suffer. Yeah, me neither, buddy. Me neither. I do think, though, that a lot of animals don't really feel pain the same way we do. But, I don't know. Regardless, never a nice thing to see. That's why I could never hunt. I talked about that uh, in a previous stream. I was playing some of that, uh, what's it called? It's called like Hunter Call of the Wild or something. It's like a deer hunting game. And even the virtual deer, because like if, if you do go hunting, you're supposed to, uh, you're supposed to get them in one shot, right? Because you don't want them to suffer. But like, oh man, I was just winging these virtual deer. I must have winged like nine deer. And I was like, okay, I, this is stupid. Just imagining all these deer running around with a bullet in their ass. And it's like, it's no good. Did not make me feel good. Goldsman says, a lot of reason for hunting season is because of human action. Predators have gone down in number a lot. So we basically have to take up the mantle of hunter. Yeah, that's a good point. There used to be a whole lot more wolves around. Wolves, bears, uh, all, all kinds of predators. Um, I hear there's like, uh, like in the UK, there's like no wolves at all anymore. Wolves or bears they used to be native to the island. They say actually that, um, interestingly enough, it's an anthropological thing where they can, uh, or have been able to, at least as far as they can figure, you can date when people emigrate into uh, an area, like, you know, 6,000, 7,000 years or, or whatever, by dating the remains of animals you find, and they'll find that when people show up, everything over 200 kilograms ends up disappearing. Because we just, uh, we end up hunting it all. I don't know if it was 200 kilograms, but but it was uh, some some weight. Anything over a certain weight will end up disappearing. Which, you know, I don't know. The sitting around. Sitting around as an ancient human. There's not really much else to do. Plus, if some of these animals are threatening. I mean... They got those uh, bones of that one bird. It's this one huge bird that's like the size of a bus. But I don't know if that's real or if that's fake. Because I guess you can, uh, you can like grind down bones and then you put them in a mold with glue and you can make bones that look legit. Uh, some of the early dinosaur bones, like one of the first uh, ranges where they were pulling dinosaur bones out in the United States, they all turned out to be fake. So that's uh, one of the reasons why, like, some people who don't believe in dinosaurs, that's why they're, like, really skeptical about the whole thing. Because, like, yeah, like, a large, large majority of the early ones that they were pulling out turned out to be uh, hoaxes. It kind of makes me wonder, too, because, you know, they talk about, like, chickens are uh, the closest living relative to a T-Rex when they did genetic testing. But, like, sure they didn't just grind down a bunch of chicken bones i guess that would probably be tough because like if you're going to grind down some bones you'd probably want to use like cattle bones or something you have to grind down a lot of chicken bones and they're kind of like they're not really bony it's kind of like cartilage or whatever so probably wouldn't work goldsman says we reduce predator population so you have to keep track of wildlife population hunt specific animals at specific times to maintain a set population yeah it's good that there are people out there willing to do it especially because i couldn't do it there's no way i couldn't take that pressure of having to uh, having to shoot it perfectly in one shot. Never mind actually having to shoot a deer because they are they're just majestic, beautiful animals. I find it interesting how they just wander through town these days where I live. They don't uh, they don't care at all. They do not see people as predators, which makes me wonder how they know like like they must avoid hunters in the wild, but. If it's the same deer coming into town, I mean, you could run right up to them and just, like, boop, knock them on the head with your fist if you wanted to. I actually think it's gotten to the point where we're probably more afraid of them than they are of us. Because I had, a, like, just a huge stag come onto my my yard. And I was going to, like, go out there to check it out. And I was like, you know what, I'm actually going to stay indoors. Because, like, that thing's antlers are, like, the size of a, of, like, a, like a dresser. You know, like a piece of furniture. It could just, like, take me out in one hit. It's absolutely ridiculous. Argentavis was the largest flighted bird in history. It wasn't as big as a bus, but it was big enough to take off with a human. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about where it's like... That's the probably why they hunted these things to extinction, right? Because if you saw those things fly around, you'd be like, Yeah, we got, we got to take that out. Like, that's not something we can just have 
flying around in the sky all willy-nilly. You'd be like a hero to your village. Be like hunting a dragon. This is a sanctuary. I'm gonna be selling tea. I gotta organize these though. I gotta organize. Gotta organize, man. My brain. My brain scattered. Uh, do I even have tea? Did I sell it? One crate? I could, I could save it. It's just one crate. I'm here anyways. I'll sell it. You save it, of course, then when you sell it around when you get Emissary 5. Like, if I hit up some, uh, skeleton sloops, then I'd get a bigger bonus on it. But it's one crate. Whatever. Goldsman says the Argentavis was basically a massive vulture, and it lived in North America at the same time as humans populated the continent. So it's likely that they are where the Thunderbird legend originates from. Probably. Probably. I don't know what the deal... It, um, that might be the skeleton I saw. It was like, I don't know. It was big enough to pick up a person, certainly. We'll speak again later. Uh, maybe not. Maybe it was like half half the length of a bus. A bus is pretty big. A bus is pretty big, so... I might be exaggerating a little bit about that. But Goldsman says they went extinct around about 10,000 years ago. I'll maybe, uh, I'll check out a picture of that once I get this... Once I get this run back in the water. That's crazy, the things that used to exist, though. It's absolutely just mind-blowing to think about that, the wildlife. And then we're just, uh, these spongy little fellows with sharpened sticks that just made, like, a mockery out of evolution. It's like, oh yeah, you're a giant bird and you can fly and you have razor-sharp talons. Well, we have, uh, sharp sticks and we like to make hamburgers. Come on down. Get it done. That's why I think, like, you know, it's too bad we didn't still have uh, crazy monsters that inhabited the world. I feel like that would solve a lot of society's problems. Because I feel like there's a lot of people who are, like, really restless with life. And they don't fit into uh, modern society necessarily. And if we were just able to, like, give them a spear and a hammer and send them over to the the monster continent and be like, go hunt giant birds, man. Yeah, you might get like picked up and flown into the sky, but uh, you also get a chance to be a hero. Lots of excitement, you'll never be bored. I think that's kind of like what's missing from modern society. We always had like some sort of crazy thing that we could send, uh, send people off to do. Who needed to uh, keep busy with their hands or whatever. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we're here at Golden Sands. This is Golden Sands, right? Sugar. The one and a half brain cells I got going right now are just like. Nee, 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 nee. Uh. Wait, this is sanctuary. So is the tea. I sold the tea. I don't think I I loaded up the commodities though, right? Because I would have had to. I had to have had the harpoon going. It's just a countdown till I get uh, port blasted here. Goldman says we used to be much more durable, but the same mutation that changed our brain structure also caused us to be physically weaker. But the mental capabilities were apparently better than strength at that point in time, seeing we exist. Yeah, it's really interesting the way that goes hand in hand. I don't know if there's, um, if that's like, how do I put this? Nobody really knows what the reason for it is, but I looked. I looked it up one time, or I saw an article or something, and it's like the whole thing about domesticating animals, right? Where you'll take like a coyote or a, or a wolf, and as you breed them to domesticate them, the same genes that cause them to be friendly around people also cause them to look like not wild anymore. They get that domesticated look about them. They look like a lot friendlier. And apparently it's the exact same, uh, the exact same genes. So you can't have one without the other. Like, you'll never be able to domesticate a wolf and have it be uh, an animal that's that's friendly around people and behaves like a dog without having it also look like a dog. Which is like, okay. That sounds controversial, but apparently I read that one time. I don't know what they call that. That's not... Uh, I was thinking about like epigenetics, but that's another thing. That's that thing where you get like exposed. You get exposed to environmental factors and it like activates your genes or something, but but yeah. Genetics are crazy. We don't understand them.
Goldsman says the chimpanzee is the closest living thing to what our ancestor was like since they're descended from the same ancestor but didn't have the same mutation in the brain. Yeah, that's, uh, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. It was funny when uh, Europeans traveled to, to Africa. All the African tribes thought the European guys looked like chimpanzees. Because they had, like, you know, that light, uh, light brown chimp hair and hairy arms. And they're like, hey, you guys look like chimps. It's like, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. There's apparently uh, chimps that spearfish now. Holdsman says that's pretty funny, yeah. But I mean, it's true, right? It's true, it's true. But yeah, there's apparently uh, chimps that spearfish, you can look it up, which is like absolutely wild. Because you also think about how much, like, we're pretty smart as people, right? But how much of our intelligence is, like, actual intelligence and how much of it is actually just culture? Because I don't know if you've ever heard of the stories of, uh... There are children that sometimes get raised by animals, either through neglect or extraordinary circumstance. They actually get, like, abandoned in the woods and they'll be raised by a uh, pack of dogs. And then uh, these kids, when you try to reintegrate them into society, uh, uh, some of them you, you can't really ever reintegrate them because they just, they're basically like wild animals because they've been raised by wild animals, right? So you gotta wonder how much of uh, what we're capable of doing is uh, some sort of a genetic thing and how much of it is like a uh, how much of it is like an environmental, cultural thing? Where like, I don't know, a lot of people seem to think we're smarter than we used to be 300 years ago, but... A lot of that's just like, education and, and whatever. Uh, Goldsman says that's not just chimps, a lot of apes are now using tools. Really, that's like, uh, that's pretty crazy. Craziest thing I've ever seen was apparently bonobo apes are the smartest of the apes that they found. I think bonobo actually means like little little man or something in the local language. And um, I saw a video of a bonobo ape playing Pac-Man. They taught it to play Pac-Man. And it was like playing Pac-Man. And it knew how to play Pac-Man. And if it won, they like gave it food and stuff. And it knew how to, uh, you know, maneuver around, eat all the dots. It could uh, eat the power pill and then chase the ghost. I was like, this is like disturbing, man. This is disturbing. I think that animals are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. They're a lot more capable of uh, complicated thought and stuff, but it's just that because they're animals, they don't really have a reason to care about things, so they don't decide to engage in complicated thought. But if you bring them into a condition and you like raise them in a laboratory, um, sometimes you can get them to do smart things, but it was like... That whole thing with, uh, uh, Neil Tyson was talking about that, because I saw that in a Joe Rogan interview, where, um, we have videos now, because everybody has an iPhone, and they all have cameras and stuff, and I saw a video of a uh, crow, and another video of a magpie, where they were trying to get a, a drink out of a, a bottle full of water, right? So he'd stick his beak into the bottle of water, drink water out of it, and then when it got down too low, he'd go and take a rock, and drop it into the bottle of water to raise the water level and then drink out of it. And that's like, to people like 50 years ago studying birds, like that's absolutely mind blowing that a bird would be intelligent enough to understand water displacement. And if you put it in a lab and you tried to get it to demonstrate that intelligence, you probably couldn't even actually reproduce that in a lab environment because they just have to be like in the quizzical mood in the time to perform the experiment or whatever. But now that we're able to film them all the time, then it's like, yeah, you see animals sometimes doing like the craziest, most intelligent stuff. But that's like, you know, I know a lot of people who like, they're smart people, but they don't, they don't apply themselves because they just don't really care because they don't find the need to or whatever. And I think that's probably the deal with a lot of animals where like, they probably have a lot going on in their head and they're probably thinking a lot of stuff, but they just don't like, they just act like animals because that's just what they are, like, and they know that that's what they are, and they just think that we're probably idiots. 
Holtzman says the thing about intelligence, we aren't smarter than our ancestors. The same girl sitting in a Starbucks drinking her half cafe double frappuccino is says we're so much smarter than those dumb cavemen. Worse since I have a smartphone. Can't make a smartphone herself and would have no clue how to make a stone knife. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying, right? That's why I wish like people would uh, they'd give our ancestors a lot more credit. I think that um, a lot of the ways like we used to live for one way or another uh, we could like learn a lot from the past, a lot more from the past, instead of just throwing everything out because it's just like, oh, we're so much smarter now. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, your average person doesn't really know as much as they think they know. Like, just because you have a smartphone doesn't mean like you even know how to build one. It's actually to the point where like, man, computers are actually. I don't think there's any single one person on the planet who can really explain entirely how they work. Um, I mean, you know. We all know the theory behind it, but like the whole thing about like microchips, how it turns like you're just taking electricity from the wall, running it through a microchip, and then uh, magic. Whoa. It's absolutely mind blowing to think about that, how it's just like it's a series of switches that takes electricity and then it takes like uh, reroutes that into pictures and takes the input and it does. Uh, does what it does because of like 30 years of people programming from the very basic assembly code in like the 70s or whatever all the way up to what we have now and i've also talked about that too how you know like playing battlefield 5 they couldn't put the double xp weekend in anymore because they were like oh we don't have the technology anymore and it's like can you seriously not like you can't program double xp weekend into your game but it's like well when the game engine's 15 years old and like nobody, uh, nobody's working for the company who originally made the game engine. Then like, no, you kind of can't put double XP weekend in anymore because nobody really understands what all the variables are and like how the code was written. And you'd have to like rewrite the game from scratch in order to uh, have that ability again. Goldsman says, like making a stone knife. Okay, hold on a second. Backing up a bit, he says we have information that our ancestors had that is useful to us now. Back then they had information we don't use now that was vital to them back then. Like making a stone knife, if you ask people to make a stone knife, they think it's just smacking rocks together until you get one that's a knife. And if you ask them to sharpen a stone knife, they will dull the hell out of it trying to grind it on a stone. Yeah, I couldn't even begin to explain to you how that would work. They took a lot of pride in that stuff. I uh, knew a girl who was into anthropology and she told me they found a, uh, a site that had a whole bunch of immaculate stone axes buried in the ground. And they think that what it was, was like 8,000, 9,000 years ago or whatever. It was basically like an axe convention where all the people would come from like all around and then they just like show off their axes to each other. How cool their axes were and then they buried them in the ground just to prove that it was like, yeah, this is my finest axe and we have a million of them because we're so much better than you so we're just going to bury them in the ground and it was some sort of ceremonial burying of the axe. Which is funny because people talk about like burying the hatchet, right? So actually maybe that was like something to do with it, but apparently they found like hundreds of these things in this one spot And they were all just like the finest of the finest axes that you could possibly make so So yeah, I don't know It's interesting too because I talked about that uh, in another stream where there was apparently a uh, science thing Where if you take an animal Say like uh, an animal a prey animal and you put them on an island it takes seven generations for the animal to uh, forget about its predators. So even if that uh, animal, five generations down, has never been exposed, like you take a, a deer that would know about coyotes or wolves, and you put them on an island, and five generations down, you take their offspring and you expose them to a coyote or a wolf, they would know that it was a predator and they would run away from it and know how to treat it. But after seven generations, apparently they forget. So that makes me think about, like, think about a lot of the stuff we're going through right now. Like, we don't have that generational experience. Whatever it is that causes that, we don't have, uh, we don't have that information to deal with, like, a lot of the new things that are going on right now. Whereas back then, even in, uh, even into, like, the 1800s, not that far back, people's lives were, like, pretty consistent to one generation to the next. Like, you could go back seven generations and your ancestors seven generations ago were probably living very similar to the way that we're living now. Whereas you even go back like three generations now and things are actually quite different since we've got the internet and everything. 
Goldsman says making a stone knife is like chess. You have to actually look closely at it and realize you have to break two other pieces before you can break the one piece you want to break. That's interesting. Because if you don't break off the one or two right parts of the stone before trying to break off the part you need to break for the edge you need, you'll just break the edge off the knife. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. That makes me want to go try to make a stone knife, thinking about that. Making uh, stone tools would be uh, would be really cool, right? Because I always kind of figure that it's like you just got to walk around and find like just just the right piece of uh, piece of material. A lot of it is probably just like, you know, picking up stones and picking up sticks until you find uh, one that's going to work. Instead of taking up, you know, you don't just take any stone to make a knife out of it. You got to find the right stone. And I think that would be a lot of fun just walking around trying to find the right stone. Goldsman says it's actually an art style to make stone knives. Yeah, it must be. Because that's the thing, right? It's like you're not uh, you're not just making stone knives out of any stone. You got to find the right stone. And then you got to figure out how to uh, break the knife out of it or whatever. However that works. It's cool stuff. Yeah, talking about that generational knowledge. That might be why people are so stressed out these days. Because we don't have that generational knowledge. So all we got to do is make it seven generations into the future and we'll be fine. That's only like, uh, what, like 300 years or something? No big deal. No big deal. We just get to be the uh, amazing pioneers. Pioneers of future world. All we got to do is just fight off the stupid doomers on Reddit. Okay, Dagger Tooth, they got some minerals. Do I even have minerals though? I only have one crate, so whatever, I'm going to hold on to those. Well, you know, I'm already right here, so I'll just do it anyways. Yeah, stone tools are cool. Goldsman says the thing is, I know the basics of how to make a stone knife, and after I learn the very basics of it, anytime I see stone, I always see the break pattern of a rock. And no, it can or can't be made into a knife. That's cool. I wonder how much of that is like... I wonder how much of that is just like a part of our brain, you know? Like maybe we still have a part of the brain that's dedicated once you unlock it and you figure that out. It's like a part that uh, just knows, knows how to work stone. Goldsman says it takes a massive stone to make a full knife. That's interesting. Because it's probably because you have to, uh, you got to break apart, like, like you said, you got to break it twice. Break massive pieces off it, and I guess the knife is just in there somewhere. Stone, stone working. We should go back to stone working. Forget about metal, we should just make tools out of stone. You could make like wrenches and screwdrivers out of stone. Too bad it wouldn't work. I mean, I guess like uh, metal is kind of like it comes from stone. Sort of like stone. Goldsman says, really cool fact actually glass toilet, uh, porcelain, and chocolate. All those have the right brake pattern for making a stone knife. Porcelain, I can absolutely see. If you've ever break in a toilet before, man, it practically just turns into a bunch of knives. Goldsman says, so if you're in a free freezer, you could literally, literally make a chocolate knife. Yeah, absolutely. Did you ever hear about that one guy that made a knife out of his own excrement? He was like a, um, he was like one of those Arctic, uh, Arctic dudes. Arctic explorer. I wonder if that was even a true uh, a true story now that I think about it. Because he just looked like... There's pictures of him and he looked like such a... Such a stereotypical Arctic exploring guy that I wonder if like his stories were just made up. Because like... How would you even fact check that? If the guy's got like a big enough beard and a big enough fur coat, I mean he could pretty much say that uh, he's been anywhere and has done anything. But that was one of the stories anyways.
Okay, so what is that? That's a skeleton galleon. There was a sloop kicking around here, but... Oh, there he is. Yeah, he's off it. Doing something somewhere. That's interesting, though. Chocolate. I could totally see that, too, because I've broken chocolate apart sometimes, and it's just like a... Makes a little sharp, jagged edges. I love pigs. How about you? I like pigs too. I like all kinds of pigs. Sometimes I wish I was a pig. Life would be a lot easier, you know. You could just roll around in your own slop, not uh, care about anything. I've heard from people who keep pigs that pigs are like, um, how do you put it? Pigs are very, they're very like, like all the other animals, when you're a farmer, they see you as the farmer, but pigs, to them, you're just another pig. They have like no respect. I heard of a guy who worked at a pig farm. He worked for a pig farmer and he learned from the pig farmer when he went in to uh, feed the pigs. He had to take a hammer in his hand. And he would hit the pigs in the head with a hammer as they came at him. Because otherwise that was like the only way he could get in to feed them. Because they just like did not care. But I also hear that pigs are like as smart as people too. So I mean if you really wanted to put the time in. There's probably a way to be a pig farmer without hitting them on the head with a hammer. Just saying. Just saying. Not that I'm a pig farmer. I am a toga merchant. But if they really were that smart. Could you imagine a pig sitting at Starbucks? talking on a smartphone. Goldsman says, yeah, ancient people were by no means dumb. As some people think, they just literally had no way of knowing that mixing copper, extracting stone into wafers, and melting sand, then mixing them into the right combination would make a glowing screen. Yeah, I don't know how anybody figured that stuff out. That's the crazy thing about it, right? I guess there was just somebody who was, uh, don't forget staring at a rock for long enough who is like there's gotta be something in there there's treasure in that stone I'll tell you what could have been an accident too I know that uh, a lot of metalworking a lot of metalworking and a lot of discovery is uh, is a total accident Goldsman says people's gauge for we are smarter than cavemen is we have smartphones yeah it's funny that they call them smartphones too because uh I feel like they've only really made people dumber. Might be something to that. Like, you know, I don't want to sound like a Luddite or anything, but, uh... I have. I have an iPhone. Um, I didn't get it until, like... I was using, like, a Nokia flip phone until, like, probably 2014, 2015. And then I just, uh, picked up an iPhone. Somebody was selling it secondhand. I needed a phone, so I was like, yeah, sure. I'll buy it off you cheap, have an iPhone, but I've never used it for, like, the internet or anything. Even though I have it, I just don't use it for that. Yeah, I just use it like a telephone, text messages, blah, 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 whatever. But people who, like, that to me feels like a nightmare. Like, I, when I'm off the internet, if I'm out and about, I, uh, I'd rather stare at drywall than stare at my phone if I'm in, like, a waiting room or something, or I'll read one of those, uh, Time magazines or something, because it's like, yeah, I never, I'm never gonna read, like, a McLean's magazine sitting at home, so I might as well read it if I'm in the waiting room, right? Get a little exposure to, uh, a different kind of media. The whole idea of always walking around, browsing the internet, and being on your phone all the time, man, that just makes me feel sick to think about, but that's the way, uh, some people are. Which is fine, which is fine, but, you know, it just, it just blows my mind, that's all. Goldsman says that's literally it. They themselves can't make a smartphone, but call cavemen dumb because cavemen couldn't make them. So by that measure, those people are calling themselves dumb. That's pretty much the way it is, because that's kind of what people need to understand, is like our ancestors. Have you ever seen those pictures of people, um standing next to like renaissance paintings and they look exactly like the dude in the renaissance paintings it's crazy to think about how you know people who uh who look exactly the same who could be twins with somebody who is 600 years ago it's absolutely crazy i mean if you look at um that country singer hank williams there's uh hank williams the first hank williams the second and hank williams the third 
and they were all country singers. And Hank Williams the first and Hank Williams the third look exactly the same almost. It's absolutely uncanny the way that uh, the way that that works. I have no idea. Nobody does. Genetics, man, absolutely crazy. Did you know that we uh, we share like 60% of our genetic material with a banana? Did you know that? Absolutely crazy. Might be why sometimes I feel like hanging from a tree with a bunch of other uh, banana-shaped people. It's not weird, is it? Yeah, it's probably weird. Okay, so it's uh, one hour, five minutes into this journey. Going to be sailing over to... Uh, where are we going? Galleon's Grave. Up, up, and away. Get me out of this crazy toaster. Goldsman says if you can't make a smartphone and cavemen are dumb just because they couldn't, then you're just as dumb as them. But if you can't make a stone knife and they can, that means you're dumber than them. Yeah, absolutely. Because at least the cavemen could make a stone knife. Like, they couldn't make a smartphone, neither can you. But uh, at least they could make a stone knife, absolutely. Genetics is actually a cool thing. All that breaks down to is what is where and how much there is. Yeah, genetics is like... It absolutely ridiculous. Oh yeah, also, yeah, because Goldman says the two most genetically complex things in the world are tiny. Yeah, so we have like 20, what, 23 chromosomes, I think. And a wheat plant has like 44 chromosomes, I think. So like, genetics, genetics, man. Absolutely, uh, absolutely mind blowing. I think there's probably more to that than we know what's going on with that stuff. Cause I've talked about that before, like the whole idea that you can take those four molecules, whatever it is, uh, that make up genes. You know, there's only four of them. It's a combination of four different molecules strung into a polymer of uh, infinite length, because you can just keep stringing them together. And any combination of those four different molecules can create literally any kind of life, any kind of life imaginable without limits, because if there were limits to it, then evolution wouldn't work. That's like the whole, um, foundation of evolution is that those four combinations or the combination of those four things in our genes and every other uh, genes of life on this planet you can combine that to make literally anything like there's jellyfish there's jellyfish that spend uh, half their life as a plant and then the plant grows up and buds off jellyfish and then they fly around as jellyfish as like a, a anim animalistic organism and then eventually they'll fall back down and when they reproduce they turn into a plant again. Goldsman says the organism with the most genes is a microscopic thing called a water flea while well, the organism with the most chromosomes is a fern. So small that the whole plant roots and all can fit on your pinky? Man, we gotta study that fern. Maybe there's something about it. Maybe it knows more about the uh, secrets of the universe than than it lets on. Have we ever tried to? Uh, have we ever tried to communicate with it? Have we tried grinding it up and smoking it? Maybe it's like uh, maybe it's like got a bunch of DMT in it or something. Somebody bring it to Joe Rogan. He'll know what to do with it. That's wild, though. A fern. I wonder why it's so. Uh, I wonder why it's so complex. Same thing with the water flea. Like the whole thing about chromosomes too, like that's pretty crazy. Cause yeah, chromosomes can be differing in size, right? So just cause you have the most chromosomes doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have the most genetic material either. It's funny too how they say like, I don't know what percentage of our genome, it's a, a large majority of it though. Um, they call it junk DNA because they have no idea what it does because most DNA that we know uh, creates RNA and then creates proteins and then those proteins control most of our biological processes and development so those are the genes we know about but then there's genes that they've just never seen them do anything and we have no idea what they do they're just like in there and they chill out of course they'd call them junk DNA classic science 
classic modern science where it's like the appendix that they're like, oh, we don't know what it does. It must be useless. But it turns out the appendix does serve a little bit of a function beyond just like occasionally exploding inside of you. Appendixes, man. Goldsman says, and that plant was discovered in Utah and is just sitting in fields all over. There are people that have stomped all over them and don't even realize they stepped on something with over half a thousand chromosomes. Are you serious? Half a thousand and we're sitting here with 23? We're sitting here with 23? Give me a break. I feel shortchanged now. What was that whole conspiracy theory too about chromosomes? Not conspiracy theory. It's more like, I don't know what you'd call it. Crazy, uh, crazy new age. Um, whatever, because we've got 23 chromosomes, but every other primate has more chromosomes than us. And they've never seen an animal lose chromosomes during evolution. But maybe, like, uh, maybe we're just, like, we're, like, genetically defective apes. Like, that was the first people. It wasn't, like, a, a gradual evolution. I don't know. Genes are absolutely astounding. When I first heard about genes, man, when they told me about genetics in uh, elementary school, when we first learned about that stuff, I thought it was like a joke. I thought they weren't, they weren't like telling us the truth. Cause I was like, for real, like you're telling me there is a code of molecules inside of everyone's body that determines what they are like that. That's pretty much like, uh, not really science, is it? Like, that doesn't sound like science to me. Like, what? Oh, okay, Goldsman says a lot of that junk DNA is actually viral DNA. Like, just under 10% of our DNA is actually from a nerd viral DNA that just stuck behind. Maybe. That makes sense, though, because I've heard about that, too. Because, yeah, what is that word? Ugh. Viruses can actually, what, they, like, add their DNA to our own or something. Viruses in and of themselves are super crazy because what they do is they uh, inject their own DNA into the host organism and then it, if I'm remembering this correctly, it takes over the DNA of the of the host cell and rewrites the DNA to produce more viruses instead of perform its normal functions. Which is just absolutely mind blowing. Also, too, when you like, if you've ever seen a picture of a virus, how oh, they just look like. You're not gonna let me sell. Meg, take the stone. Take. Oh. Glitch in the matrix. Glitch in the matrix. Okay, we're good. Yeah. So. The. Uh, you ever seen a picture of a virus? They just look like little little crystals with legs on them. Which is, uh, which is crazy, because it's like, where did that stuff come from, man? They're not actually, like, they're technically not alive, but they're like little capsules with uh, DNA inside of them that are just flying around, and then they hijack organisms to produce more of themselves. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Goldsmith says that mutation we were talking about that increased our mental capacity was actually two chromosomes fusing into one. Okay, so now the, the conspiracy theory deepens, right? Because it's like, um, that's really interesting that that's, uh, that that's something like, you know, when people do have genetic, I hate to call them genetic disorders or whatever. I didn't mean to say like genetically deficient or whatever. I know that a lot of them are, ah, well, they are what they are. But if you've ever known somebody with Down syndrome, man, they're just like, they're really cool people. That's all I got to say, like seriously. But, uh, that can happen in people, right? Where you have, uh, fused chromosomes missing chromosomes, doubled chromosomes and stuff. So it's something that could have, uh, like it's interesting to think about if we had two, a chromosome that fused naturally, that would have had to have happened in like two people simultaneously within a close enough uh, geographical location that they could have reproduced. Which is like crazy to think about. Either that or it was aliens. Like that's what I'm getting at where people are like, I remember now what the whole thing is because they figure that uh, that doesn't happen naturally. Having chromosomes fuse. That like aliens came down and they, they made us. 
Didn't do a very good job if that's the case. Uh, could I uh, call up the manufacturer? Hello? Hello, he manufacturers of humans? I'd uh, like to talk to you about something. JK, JK, we're just, we're doing our best out here. Okay. You know, okay. <laughs> Goldsman says that crystal with legs, it's a bacteriophage virus. Viruses come in many shapes, and a bacteriophage is just the most iconic in terms of shape. Yeah, that's the one, that's probably the one that they, uh, they always show off in the textbooks because it's the most impressive. Impressed to me, anyways. That stuff's, uh, it's pretty crazy. If somebody said that, that that's what existed, hey, hey, hey. if that's what viruses looked like, but they didn't have proof, if we didn't have pictures of them, people would be like, you're absolutely insane. Like, there's no way that that's what a virus looks like. Like, what are you telling me? There's reptilians that live on the moon as well? Like, it's impossible. Goldsman says viruses are basically just shells that can naturally form proteins, and either loose RNA or DNA end up filling it through some means. Yeah, some means. Some crazy voodoo magic, I'll tell you what. Yeah, life is weird. I feel like there's some about it. I mean, obviously, we don't understand everything about it, but... There's something else, uh, something else going on with it. DNA is just like... I don't think it's the end-all, be-all. But we'll see. That's really uh, exciting that they're able to cure genetic disorders. I read about that in the news there. Through, um, what do they call that? Some sort of gene therapy. So that's exciting to think about. It has other implications as well, but I think the thing is about, about DNA is like, we're never going to figure it out. We're never going to figure it out. It's, it's one thing when somebody has like a a genetic disease that would be fatal. I think it's easy to figure that out because uh, it's the same thing with vitamins, right? Like the way they found uh, the existence of vitamins, all vitamins are is uh, something that if you have a nutritional deficiency of that chemical in your body, then you'll end up with what they thought was the disease, but is actually a nutritional deficiency. So like, I think uh, certain kinds of vitamin B, you'll get rickets. Uh, if you don't have enough vitamin C, you'll get scurvy. And they used to think that like scurvy and rickets were the same as every other disease. And then some brilliant scientist came along and he figured out, um, you know, it's actually maybe a nutritional thing. So he, he ended up curing a bunch of these diseases that way. And each, uh, each vitamin is something that we have to have or else uh, you'll end up You'll end up with uh, symptoms of a disease like nature if you don't have enough of it. Goldsman says, talking about viruses here, since they're made of proteins, they're covered in protein markers that body cells will accept, which is what causes them to dump off the DNA or RNA into the cell, which then your cell reads as DNA to be printed, which creates another virus. The biology behind viruses is insane, and that's why they aren't seen as living things, because they're just a shell of DNA inside that doesn't react. Yeah. It just floats and then interacts with cells just by touching it, which creates more of them. Yeah, they don't have any natural biological processes of, of their own when they're floating around. Like, for all intents and purposes, they're just, like, like you said, they're just shells. They're just shells full of uh, DNA and RNA, depending on the virus, I guess. Absolutely wild stuff. Wild, wild stuff. Find a lot of biology. Is, uh... Man, it's practically like magic. That's why it's always fun to read about it, because it's like... The fact that that's the way it works is just mind-blowing. Really makes you appreciate, you know, I've, I've joked about it with, uh, with it people going? before, where it's like, you know, you ever have a bad day... And it's like, well, you, you got to remember that, like, your body Until next time, is a, literally a collection of one trillion separate organisms all working together. You got uh, as many cells in your body as they are stars in the night sky, um, visible and invisible. Like a trillion, over a trillion cells. It's between one, one and five trillion cells, I think, uh, depending on the person, right? So the whole fact that your alarm clock doesn't go off and your body scatters into a trillion pieces and they all just run in off in separate directions is like a miracle in and of itself. 
Goldsman says the only reason people call it a dead virus is because the genes in them will break down since it has nothing to maintain it like a living cell. Hmm. So if the DNA breaks down, it just becomes an inert shell that does nothing. Interesting. Am I missing something here? A galleon's grave. Selling stone. Goldsman says literally virus shells are just naturally forming shells of proteins. It's wild. Yeah, it is wild. Yeah, it's absolutely wild because of like the whole implications of life that um, you have a bunch of these molecules which are just like they just exist naturally in the universe created in uh, in stars. All matter. All matter is created during the life cycle of a star and then if you just uh, leave it alone for long enough and uh, you get the right conditions where it can combine then it just starts to take on the properties of life which is interesting because talk about you know doomers on reddit and all that where they think that People get this impression that, like, you know, people are some sort of unnatural scourge upon the planet. But it's like, uh, we're just as natural as the sunset. We're supposed to be here for one reason or another. It's all part of whatever else is going on. Goldsman says if DNA doesn't kill it, it's just a protein shell. That eventually, if you're filled with them, your body will realize, wait, this is a foreign protein that doesn't belong. Yeah, thinking about the immune system and white blood cells and stuff, that's pretty amazing stuff. Uh-oh. Whoa-oh. Water's getting a little high here. Yeah, if you really want to uh, trip out viewers, go look at uh, go look at how the immune system of the body works. Never-ending battle. Nice to get that skeleton sloop in. Got a couple of notches there on the emissary flag. Ah, uh, ha, ha. Are you going to talk about mitochondria? Goldsman says as well, cells. The first cells were other protein shells that were just larger with a little more in it, but no DNA. When the Earth was chemical soup of empty protein shells, RNA and DNA, a virus could have literally just pumped its DNA into an empty cell shell and that created life. Yeah, because uh, I guess that's the whole thing, right? If you mix a bunch of proteins, like proteins can occur naturally uh, under special circumstances. So you have this soup full of chemicals. And then you end up with protein shells. I think that's pretty much where they've gotten, because they've tried to create life uh, artificially, trying to simulate the first life that was created. And you get like a soup of stuff, and if you like, I think zapping it with electricity helps sometimes, or it's like certain heat, heat, uh, heat levels or something. And they've managed to, I think, like you said, you find protein shells will create uh, themselves naturally over time. But the whole idea how it's like you got to get that protein shell and then you got to have like DNA or RNA and then you got to get it into the shell. Uh, Goldsman says RNA and DNA can self-replicate outside of a shell. Yeah, I guess it probably could, hey? But cells recreate the same DNA over and over. Yeah, that's probably like... There's really no reason why it couldn't happen. That's the crazy thing of uh, talking about DNA and talk about RNA is how it's literally, like literally just some molecules that when you put it in the right solution of chemicals, that whole way that it creates proteins, where there'll be like a protein that attaches itself to the DNA and then it pulls in molecules from the soup inside the nucleus and like zippers along it and shoots off uh, proteins. And then those proteins get uh, either used in the cell or delivered to other places in your body. So I guess the whole thing is if you did have, uh, if you did, <laughs> if you did have, um, you did have DNA just like floating around, 
in the uh, super chemicals it totally could naturally reproduce produce because that's the whole thing if you look at a uh, mitosis of a cell or whatever how it's like it splits apart and then when it splits apart it replicates itself by pulling in the uh, molecules from the other side where's my loot skelly shit where's my loot where's my loot skelly shit Goldsman says humanity actually created the first man-made life a while back under similar conditions as early chemical soup earth. They created from scratch a cell wall. They created DNA from scratch and inserted it into the cell and it became a living cell. That's unbelievable. I want to look that up. Was that uh, relatively... If it was in the, the last 20 years, I wouldn't have heard about it, basically. So they've probably been doing a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff. Ah, Goldsman said they even decided to assign a specific letter to different proteins and use that and coded the names of uh, all the people that worked on the cell into its genetics. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I wish they would, uh, I wish they'd always put like a lot of effort into naming things. It's pretty common in science, they just, whoever discovers it, they just name it after themselves. So like literally everything in science is just like a name. Which is funny because I hear there's some sort of spiel about the Bunsen burner where it's like Bunsen didn't even invent it. He just like changed it a little bit and then called it the Bunsen burner and now I call it the Bunsen burner and it's like, yeah, okay. So I guess I'm not going to get that loot or what? Like, this Megalodon's going to take a piece out of me if I don't get going though. It's just all bluey green eyes. Should be seagulls around here for that skelly loot, but I don't know. I don't see them. As long as I got the emissary bonus, that's all good. Bolton says they don't know if it could be dangerous or not, though, so they basically coded it so it would need to be fed a specific selection of chemicals or it would die. So it's basically a kill code, so if it gets out, it won't cause any trouble. Right on. It's always good. It's always good to do things properly. It's always good to do things properly. Especially when you're dealing with genetic research, good grief. That's cool about that, uh, that fusing of the chromosomes. I'm gonna have to like, look that up. Goldsman says that shows how far mankind can go since we have literally created life of our own. I know, could you believe that uh, 8,000 years ago we were so stupid we didn't even know how iPhones worked? Ha ha ha, yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty crazy, pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. Pretty crazy stuff. I hope it's uh, I hope it's only used for good. Did they use genetics to make a better ice cream cone? Because I mean, ice cream cones are pretty good. They're pretty good, but you know, maybe we should uh, take it to the next level. Alter the genome of the ice cream. Or, I mean, I guess the cow, probably. Or the almond, you know, if you're using almond milk. They have almond ice cream. Look that up. Goldsman says something which Bible, uh, some Bible thumpers will say only God Almighty can create life. And man created life now. True, but who made man? God Almighty. That's the thing, you can't really, uh... <laughs> you can't really argue with some people. Goldsman says, like, I have nothing against anyone of any religion. I have my own beliefs. Bible thumpers are really the only people I can't stand. Yeah, I was talking about, like, uh... I was talking about it a little bit in uh, some other streams there. I try to stay away from it. I don't, I don't want to, like, um, how do I put this? It's all good fun, having fun in the live stream, but sometimes when I post things to, uh... I post, I post all these to YouTube, right? So I don't want to... 
I don't want to have something that's going to sit there for four years and then eventually the wrong people might find it and get really upset about it because people take things really seriously, right? My whole thing is like I study, uh, I study all religions because, you know, I went through a period of my life there where just like everybody else, I was looking for some answers. So I was like, you know what, I'll just check out all these spiritual texts of everybody. And it seems to me that like they're all kind of saying the same thing, but they have sort of their own different interpretations and applications of the same truths that they're all studying and there's really good things in there but yeah I'll tell ya um, people who get really fanatical about it people who get really fanatical about anything it does them no good it does the world no good because that's the whole thing my only problem with any any religion if I'm gonna have one is that uh, if there's any of them that just can't seem to accept uh, that there is truth in all sources, you know? So if it's like, if you're only going to read one book, you're not going to get the whole picture. And I think we'd all do good to, uh, take a look at, um, take a look at everything that was written by everybody, regardless of what side it was on. And in this modern age, pick through it and figure out what's still relevant to today and which of it is just maybe a product of the times. Because I, I certainly think, I mean, any religion, I'm not going to, uh, name any of them specifically, but they're all good. Like, absolutely all of them. Like, literally all of them. Even the ones that you, you know, you might think there's nothing redeemable in there. They all have absolutely phenomenally uh, important things to say. And that's why they've gotten to where they are in the world. Is because there's a lot of, of obvious, uh, obviously good stuff in there. And they all, I've talked about that before. How they all, I think, have very, uh, very similar, very similar roots. And they've all actually kind of descended and branched out from each other to become what they are today. So for any of any of these uh, mainstream religions or otherwise to uh, be at odds with each other, I think is absolutely ridiculous because if they'd really read each other's holy books and figure things out, they'd realize that they'd realize that it was all coming from the same source. You know, it's all coming from people, man. We're all just people and we're all just trying to find truth. And there's different angles and different applications of that truth. But I think that it's all kind of the same thing, and they do well to actually work work together instead of work against each other. Goldsman says, I do find it funny how some apologists will say our God is true because our book says he exists. And the book says that he says that the book is true, yeah. Like, it's totally circular logic when you say that God is true because he says the book is true in the book that he says is true. Yeah, that's the thing. There are a lot of people who think with that circular logic. And that doesn't... Um, that doesn't do anybody good. I mean, science even. Science will do that sometimes. Like, that was the whole thing, talking about dark matter and dark energy. Where they think that this stuff exists just because they've got equations uh, from the, the early 1900s which say it uh, should exist. Or rather, they hold those equations true, and then um, they can't predict the spin of the galaxy, right? You know? So they decide that uh, dark matter and dark energy must exist. Um, but somebody was in here. That was Free Line who was in there. He's saying that now they're calling it uh, they're calling it dark gravity. I like that a lot better. That's like a way better way of putting it. Because the whole idea of dark matter was that you have all this this matter. They still call it matter, even though we have no way of detecting it. Um, and it has no interaction with other matter beyond the fact that it exerts gravity. So that was like totally whack, but I guess they're moving away from that now, calling it dark, uh, dark gravity, which is like, yeah, that's I guess that's fine because we don't really understand uh, gravity as it is. But but it's the whole thing with black holes too, like with uh, the whole Einstein and his uh, E equals M C square that predicted the existence of black holes, and he was like, you know, I don't think my math is perfect because I don't think that um, black holes actually could exist. But here we are. Here we are in the modern age. We still don't really 100% know if they exist, to be honest, but they might. We got some candidates out there. I'm waiting for uh, I'm waiting for the proof. I'm waiting until they can put me in a rocket, shoot me into space so I can fly through one of them, like in, uh, in Interstellar. Then I'll believe, I'll believe, but until then I'm, I'm holding out judgment on that. Goldsman says there's something funny with specifically the Christian Bible in history. Is that true? Is that true? There's actually some uh, some legit funny some funny parts in there. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to get into it though because I feel like any time I try to start talking about like the Bible or any specifically any kind of religion like for one like I said I've studied them um, and I think there's some really good things in in all of them 
but um, it I I can't like for instance talking about like Buddhism I can't really say I can't really say how a modern mainstream Buddhist lives their life and what practices they abide by because like I don't know any of them personally uh, I've never visited their countries and seen the way they live so it's like if you were like an outsider studying Christianity you would think it wasn't really about what it's actually about when people actually go to church in their communities and it also depends on every separate church and blah blah and whatever and I feel like it's very tough to really talk about the specifics of any religion without it seeming like I'm covertly trying to like sway people's opinions one way or the other so so I'm gonna like gotta be really careful as I walk the line on that one but I just gotta say that um, there's like some really really good beliefs and uh, powerful stuff in, in all in all religions but I just wish that they would I wish they would collaborate man I really think that we would do well as a world if literally all the mainstream religions that we have you know you take the top five or top six of them if they all got together in a room and just threw their best stuff on the table they really could do well to create like a new some sort of super religion man but that's super dangerous even talking about that in and of itself, right? So it's like, oh, gotta be careful. Goldsman says, look up apocalyptic genre. Some literary historians have traced some stories in the Bible to specific stories in the Middle East and Egypt from an ancient fiction genre called apocalyptic genre. That's the thing too, right? Is like, yeah, I don't know. I kind of hold the... Uh, have you ever heard of that, what was that, Zeitgeist? That Zeitgeist uh, YouTube video that came out? I remember seeing that. Um, that was by the same people who did the Loose Change documentary on the Twin Towers there. Which was like, I don't know, it was what it was. But that Zeitgeist one, dude, that one was like just... Now being an adult, they were trying to say that the story, uh, the story in the Bible was the same as the story of like Horus and the story of Mithra and blah 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 and like dude you look at the stories of Horus and Mithra and it's like they are nothing close it was just like a huge load of huge load of crap but like so I I mean I don't know I take that stuff with a grain of salt um anybody who tries to like uh tries to speak ill of any religion I feel like they have a they have a personal vendetta or a score to settle or something, so they're usually just as deceitful as the people that they're trying to, uh, they're trying to, to say is no good. Because I mean, seriously, like, how how do we really know? Um, how do we really know what kind of books they were reading in ancient Egypt? I guess. Goldsman says E equals MC square has nothing to do with black holes. That specific equation about the conversion rate of matter to raw energy. Yeah, but it predicts black holes because it uh, it's that whole idea where if you have uh, enough gravity, enough matter in one space, E equals MC squared is uh, also uh, a description of gravity. Uh, they were able to predict the orbit of Mercury using it. That was the reason why they knew it was true, because previous to E equals MC squared, if you just use Newton's equations of gravity being uh, 9.82 meters per second squared, then the orbit of Mercury doesn't make any sense, this and then Einstein came up with E equals MC squared. And suddenly the little there's like a little womp in Mercury's orbit, and they were able to predict that, so they're like, yeah, it must be true. But then if E uh, equals MC squared, that would mean, um, because of the square is in there, after you have too much matter inside a certain whatever you call density or distance then what happens is uh, it sucks everything in even light and then nothing can escape and they figured that that like Einstein thought that that was like a flaw in the equation because the whole idea that you have this situation where you get this black hole where um, there's so much gravity that not even light can escape it it was like well if that could exist then we wouldn't really have a universe because it uh, violates the fundamental laws of physics and uh, thermodynamics where you say that energy can't be created or destroyed. Like a black hole, it destroys energy and matter. So that's why he thought that it couldn't exist and for the longest time uh, they thought it was a flaw in it. And then like Stephen Hawking said something about Hawking we radiation where he's like, well, what if some of the energy escaped from a black hole and then they disappeared so it wasn't actually destroying it. And I, I, haven't, I haven't really followed it. Goldsman says you're thinking of relativity as a whole equals mc squared is just one equation that came out of relativity. Yeah, it could be the case. I'm just a uh, commodity merchant, you know. I'm not. Uh, I'm not up to snuff on uh, on all the latest black hole theory and whatever. And plus, also too, it's like you know, 
I never went uh, I never went to university for astrophysics, so I'm just working based off of based off of what I've read over the past 20 years, and then whatever I learned in science class as a kid. So there you go. I thought that uh, equals mc squared like was special relativity. I wasn't aware there were more ca um, more equations in there. I'll have to uh, have to look that up. That is the case because it is certainly peculiar. I think that the whole thing is kind of like, I don't know, the whole idea that like as you approach the speed of light, you stretch and everything, it just seems like I don't, I don't know man, I don't think that's the way it works, but I'm not Einstein, so I'm not going to sit here trying to argue it on a commodity stream. Goldman says black holes don't destroy it so much as they basically incorporate the mass they consume into themselves, so it just condenses so small that it's hard to measure. Yeah, but the whole idea of it destroying it, right, is that um, previous to Stephen Hawking coming up with Hawking radiation, there was no way physically the for the uh, energy and matter to escape the black hole. So for all intents and purposes, it's destroyed because it's no longer interacting with um, any other matter in the universe, right? It's just, like, trapped in this spot. So, like, if it's trapped in a spot that nothing can escape, it's essentially destroyed. And over a long enough timeline, there'd be no energy or matter in the universe because it'd be all getting sucked into black holes, you know, over, like, trillions and trillions and billions of trillions of years. Back to making money. And that's one of the whole things with science is they say, you know, matter can't be created or destroyed. So that's why they thought that that probably wasn't a real thing, black holes. But I don't know what it was that changed the whole understanding why they... Even previous to Stephen Hawking, I know they found what they figure are black hole candidates, but I gotta look that up, because from what I uh, understand about that, it's like, you know, you can never point a telescope at a part of space and say, look, there's a black hole. We just get some weird measurements that don't necessarily match with black holes 100%, but they figured that they probably were because that whole special relativity thing. That whole special relativity thing predicted it. Goldsman says if the moon were to collapse into a black hole, it would be about the size of a golf ball, and the Earth would barely be bigger than that if it turned into a black hole. Mm. Yeah, it's a crazy thing to think about. Black holes. Get it's terrifying. We have an empire to build. Terrifying, man. I guess if you got sucked into one, though, nothing would happen. You just get, well, I mean, you wouldn't experience anything. You just get spaghettified, is what they say. You just get, like, beep, stretched out. Probably wouldn't feel it. Okay, so Moro's Peak. I'm gonna sell these silks. And then we'll be heading on up to Galleon's Grave. Wait, what's going on here? Oh, okay, no, we're not going to Galleon's Grave. We came from Galleon's Grave. I was like, why would I be going to Galleon's Grave? We're gonna be sailing to, uh, we're gonna be sailing to Ancient Spire. Goldman says matter that can't be created or destroyed. It's a very common misunderstanding. It's energy that can't be created or destroyed. Matter absolutely can't be. That's just because matter is just a state of energy. Yeah, so the whole idea though, right, is like when you're destroying matter, you're uh, just converting it into a different state. So, so I guess maybe, uh, you know, maybe I said that wrong. But you're not, uh, you're not destroying it, I guess. Nothing is uh, disappearing permanently, in any case. Goldsman says a lot of people genuinely don't understand that literally everything is energy. Even the matter you're made of. Matter is just a hyper-condensed form of energy. Yeah, it's like, um... It's energy that flows in a specific pattern. A repeating pattern. As I'm to understand it. Which I'm not to understand it, because quantum physics is really confusing. I, I, I so don't understand quantum physics because I think quantum physics is a lot like NFTs. Nobody knows what they are. Nobody knows what they are, man. But we're all just selling them for a thousand bucks to each other, buying and selling them. Uh, look out for the new launch of uh, Hogcoin cryptocurrency. Get in while it's low, folks. That's a, that's a big joke. But yeah, I mean, you look at... Um, that's the whole idea behind quantum physics, I guess, is that uh, matter is, matter is just, a, it's like a, like swirling orbits and vortices of energy that sticks in one, one spot or whatever. What do you got to say about photons? Photons are, photons are pretty cool. I was thinking about photons last night. 
And the connection between uh, electricity and magnetism that we still don't understand. I feel like there is a connection between electricity, magnetism, and gravity that we haven't figured out yet. And that's the whole reason why tornadoes spin in 90% uh, of them spin in the same direction in the northern hemisphere is because it's got something to do with uh, something to do with like gravity. It could have to do with the magnetic poles as well. I don't know. Um, Goldsman says functionality and functionally, sorry. A black hole is a state of energy that is even more condensed than matter. My bets are that the singularity that the universe once was in a state that is even more condensed than black holes even. I absolutely do believe that we live in an oscillatory universe as well because of singularities. Yeah, I don't know what an oscillatory universe is. You can school me on that one if you please. I know what, uh, you know, oscillation. Um, is that the whole idea that the universe expands until it reaches a point and then it shrinks back uh, and collapses again and then expands again then shrinks back? Would that be like oscillatory? Because that's another whole thing, right? The universe is uh, expanding at an accelerating rate and we also don't know what that's about. One of the big mysteries of science. Man, this stream has got me. I'm going to just read so much about astrophysics tomorrow. This has got me like stoked on astrophysics. Thanks for this, Goldsman. This is great. Because I'm sure there's, uh, I'm sure there's like a lot of, um, a lot of new stuff going on that I always see like YouTube videos and I dismiss it a lot, but, but it would be interesting. Like I probably should, uh, look up that whole thing about Hawking radiation. I mean, I know I like to take a big pile on uh, Stephen Hawking now and again. Just, uh, just to be edgy or whatever, but the whole thing about uh, Hawking radiation is like apparently it is explainable through quantum physics from what they've learned about quantum physics. But in my whole life, like I've kept trying to wrap my head around the whole quantum physics thing and it just seems like it's one of those things where you can never fully understand it the way that you understand other things because we don't really understand it. It began as like a practical way of explaining the behaviors that we've measured in physics, even though it makes no actual sense. Because, like I was talking about the um, spin of an electron, how there are probability fields around an atom of where an electron could be at any given moment they measure it, but there are spots in the electron orbit where the electron will never be. They'll never measure it being in that spot. So the whole idea is like, where does it go? What even is an electron, really? Like, we don't actually know. So when you try to understand quantum physics, it's like, if you're trying to get that extra, like, that comprehensive understanding where it's like, you know, how you understand how, like, a lever or a pulley works, where you're like, oh, yeah, that's that's cool, I get it. With quantum physics, there's always, like, that question mark where you're like, yeah, that's how it works, but we don't really know what it is or how it works that way. But we probably had, like, some more advances. Large Hadron Collider's going again. Goldsman says uh, an oscillatory, uh, an oscillatory, sorry, universe is when the universe expands then collapses because all things have gravity and as the universe reaches its limits the gravity of black holes will pull together even across the farthest reaches of space and come together into a hyper singularity again. Yeah, actually maybe that makes sense, I guess. The whole question is, is how it separates, like how the Big Bang happens, but my whole thing is I think that there are certain laws of physics and certain parameters of the laws of physics that we'll never be able to possibly fully understand because they might only exist in these very 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 extreme situations um, that we have absolutely no way to practically measure those forces so it's like just by the way that we have like electricity and gravity and magnetism and all those forces which we consider separate that we're able to uh, measure because we see examples of them in our day-to-day -day life. I think there might be other forces, you know, um, along the same lines that don't interact with anything until, for instance, you do have uh, an ultra-massive black hole or you're traveling at the speed of light. There might be certain laws of physics and certain energetic forces that only interact with matter and energy when it's in these extreme states. So that's why I think it's kind of like I don't know if we'll ever really see the whole picture. I, I, I like the chase. I like trying to figure it out, certainly. But I don't know if we'll ever really 
figure it all out because there certainly could be things that only happen in these very, very, very extreme uh, circumstances that we'd never be able to, like, uh, you know, fly into a supermassive black hole with our instruments and, like, measure what's going on in there to, to see these, uh, these different energetic forces at work that might be separate. But you never know that it could be that if we, um, if we keep working with the forces we have, especially through quantum physics, I mean, the whole idea is it's all got to be it's all got to be interconnected one way or the other, right? So we might be able to uh, to actually predict maybe the existence of some of these forces that might uh, only come into interaction in extreme cases. I was supposed to sell. Uh, I was supposed to sell silks, right? Silks are gone. Okay. Thought I saw a sloop in port here. I don't know if he scuttled. Let's check the old firework crate. Ghost Light, seen that one. Kraken Killer is good. Starlight. Okay, so some of these are like repeats. These are cool. These Chanting Vipers it gave me three of these right on. Uh, should go slide at him if I can see him here. Oh, yeah, he's still there. I don't know which way he's facing, but this should be fine. Oh, it's just lagging out. It's gotta like load the firework. Hey, he's just he's just checking out. This is the best. This is the best. Goldman said the coin ones are my favorite. I don't think I've shot one of those yet. I'll have to check that out. Goldman says the weaving cobra fireworks are my favorite for battle, and the coins are my favorite for the effect they got. I just found those uh, the weaving cobra, the weaving viper ones last stream, dude. Those are hilarious. I'm gonna shoot this one. Oh no, not yet! No, 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 no. Uh, had a little bit of a premature detonation there. Definitely wrecked the effect. He's gonna know we're here now. <laughs> uh, don't worry though. I'll hit him again. I'll hit him again. I'll hit him again, folks. Must be a Sunday stream. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Think he heard us? That's a nice ship. <laughs> Goldsman says, in battle, if I have time, I'll load one and spray it in the face of my enemy to blind them. Because you can still fire cannonballs while it sprays. That's a good one. There's just something about it which is so hilarious, man. Just shoots off like uh, that never ending barrage of electric snakes. What's the name on that ship? USS Krusty Socks. King Tendy 9935. Legendary Guardian. Yeah, I think that guy's probably going to be hostile once he figured out that I just shot fireworks at his ship. Might be hanging around in the uh, Pirate Legend cave, but I'll give him like a minute or something. No emissary on it or anything. Goldman says I don't think he'll be hostile if he's Legendary Guardian. Yeah, you'd think that, but uh, the most hostile ships are people's running Athena's Fortune emissaries and then Reapers, obviously. But even the Athena's Fortune ones, like Reapers, sometimes they're just people who want the uh, PVE. Uh, bonus, right, with the, the bonus on all three companies' loots, but like Athena's Fortune flags, man, 99% of the time, if you sail close enough to them, they'll always try to fight you. Because it's just like Pirate Legends. Like I was saying last stream, I think everybody on a long enough timeline, like once you get comfortable enough with combat in this game, then you just become like an aggressive sailor. And the people who don't fight you are usually the people who aren't that good at combat. But uh, some of the Athena's Fortune people have been chill. You'd think that, you know, legendary guardian, like, who are you guarding? Your pocketbook? Come on, man. You're supposed to be the good guys. 
But we are pirates. No sign of the adversary. Boltzmann says Athena's fortune is just because Athena's loot is the most sought after for steel, so they're the most paranoid faction in the game. Could be. I've noticed uh, certainly when they uh, come out of Dew in a veil, <laughs> they're always they're always aggressive, always aggressive. Boltzmann says guardians of fortune people tend to be friendly to random people. Well. Haven't sunk a ship in port yet. I might pop his sails and uh, sail him away. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how he uh, how he is. See how he is. We'll try things out here. I'm gonna check the map, make sure there aren't any reapers in the area. I probably should uh, actually take a quick trip around the island as well, just in case there's somebody behind it, because I'm gonna have to uh, abandon my ship for a second as I shoot over to the island. Check it out. See if he's hanging out. Get his opinion on uh, black holes. Maybe I don't know like not really anything else going on in current events right now except for like uh, you know a million disasters but I was thinking about like news as well how it's like what even is news you know news is like like people talk about like fake news and stuff and you can have like incorrect news and that's certainly fake but all news at the end of the day is fabricated, right? Like, something isn't really news unless somebody reports on it. So, like, can you just report on anything and that becomes news? Like, could you write a story about literally nothing? Talking about, like... Yeah, there's, like, um, a fence that's been sitting here for 50 years and it's still there. And that's the news story. And then you just put some opinion in it about fences and how fences are important or whatever. And it's like, yeah, that's news. You publish it, people read it. Uh, most of the stuff re we read seems to be... Oh. You sure a skeleton's going to be a... <laughs> you sure a red skeleton? Goldsman says, what is news? More on that coming up tonight on Channel 53 News. Yeah, exactly, right? Because it's like all news is fabricated. If you don't have people who report on it and then publish it, and it's not news. So you have to like find a story. But are you are you finding a story or are you creating the story? Like that's the thing that kind of kind of blew my mind the other night. I was thinking about that because you could create a story about just about anything if you really wanted to. But most of the uh, most of the stories we follow are always like big disasters or uh, people doing criminal things. And I guess people have to care about it for it to be news, I guess. But when it comes down to news, you can take any story and you're trying to, uh, to make people care about it when you write it. So yeah, I don't know. I didn't think about it like a lot, but I was thinking about it a bit. That's funny that this guy's like, what, he's like a legendary guardian, but isn't the skeleton the reaper's skeleton? So this guy's trying to play both sides. This guy's seriously just gonna hang out in port all day. Goldman says a lot of people have grinded out both sides. He's probably more for the Guardian side, but grinding the Reaper stuff. Could be. Well, I might have to just give him some space here, I guess. If that's the case. That's the way he's, want, he's gonna want to be. Unless he decides to uh, swim out and try to board me, but...
I'll go, uh... Let's go swing around this island, come back. Golden says in order to unlock a lot of skeleton cosmetics, you have to put on the skeleton curse for battle. So could you uh, wear the skeleton curse and then fight for the guardians and unlock it or something? I've done like uh, I've done like zero hourglass PvP since it's come out. How are these crates? Crates are organized. Goldsman says there's a combination called behind enemy lines if you enter the Reaper's Lair with the Ghost Curse on. That's pretty funny. Not a very good disguise for going behind enemy lines. Does the, uh, does the Ghost Curse... Does that keep like all your cosmetics or is there certain ones that just make you look like um, predetermined ghost models, if you know what I'm saying? Because uh, I've seen some of them and I wonder if those aren't just like the models for the uh, phantoms that you can find. Oh damn, Goldsman says the ghost curse keeps your cosmetics since it still uses your base model. That's dope, I didn't know about that. I might, uh, I might have to grind out some uh, Guardians of Fortune then, because, you know, I, um, I couldn't really decide what, uh, what side to pick there. I was thinking Guardians, but I was like, yeah, I didn't know about the Ghost Curse. Like, if it didn't keep the base model, I wouldn't think it would be worth it, but I'm also not really into the Skeleton either, because, like, to me, the Skeleton is just, like, when you're your cosmetics don't load sometimes at the start of the game. You're just like a green skeleton, so it's like, why would you want to look like that all the time? I think that's just kind of pointless. But I guess being a skeleton's pretty cool. The ghost curse would be cool. But then again, too, also, it just like turns you green, right? Nothing wrong with being green. But it also ain't easy, says Kermit the Frog. Goldman says the unloaded skeleton model is totally different from the Curse's model. Still a skeleton. Still a skeleton. I uh, I got him mixed up one time on that run where I got firebombed. So close enough for my eyes that I just don't really have any interest in it. I know there's like a lot of different cosmetics you can like put on the skeleton, which is kind of cool, but. In the uh, the same sense, that's just always still like what it reminds me of is the uh, the old cosmetics didn't load model. Two hours and three minutes. Bolton says it's a skeleton that keeps your proportions. That's pretty cool. Goldsman says so if you're funny, if your pirate has a funny shaped head, wide ribs, or a thin torso, it'll extend over to the skeleton. That's pretty cool. I guess that's a step up. All the ones I've seen just look like the uh, regularly portioned skeletons. I guess the people didn't have any uh, funny models. That would be funny to see like a big fat guy skeleton and it looks like a big fat skeleton, like somebody who's actually like big boned. Goldsman says if your pirate has a super thin head, you'll have a wedge for a skull. Wedgehead. Goldsman says it actually does look like a fat skeleton right on. That's so funny. Check it out. I actually am just big boned. I told you guys. You're not a dog. You're not real. I don't want to hear it. You are just a figment of my imagination. Well, ladies and gentlemen,
if any of you know why people sit in port for 20 minutes straight, leave a comment on this video because I seriously don't understand it. I think what I'm probably going to do is sail over there and sink his ship and then just skip the port for now. Because, like, for one, that's an absolutely horrible ship name. Just absolutely atrocious. And two, what are you doing? What are you doing in that port? Who just sits there in port for, like, an hour? Makes no sense. Absolutely no sense. Goldsman says if you look at the skeleton costume in the Emporium, that actually is the first thing that used the new skeleton model. You can see what your pirate would look like with the curse on. That's uh, that's actually a good tip. I might check that out. I haven't done uh, any ranks. I'm like, I won one fight, so I'm ranked like three in Reavers of the Flame or whatever. But. Couldn't really decide. I just don't really, like, I'm not really interested in being a ghost or a skeleton. So I, uh, I don't really know. Neither of those things really excited me. Goldsman says you can get the glowy eyed legend curse of 105 for Athena side. Yeah, I've actually already got it though. Check this out. Pretty cool. Pretty sure it's the same curse. I'm actually like almost positive. <laughs> Goldsman says, How dare you? Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, it is the same curse. Says Goldsman. Yeah, because I remember going into uh, the Athena's cave there and uh, checking it out and it was already unlocked for me, so. I think they gave that away in like season three or something. So that's how I got it. But don't tell anybody, because it makes me look like a crazy uh, PvPer. All right, so am I gonna sink this guy or not? I kinda, I kinda got a feeling if I sink him, I'm just gonna start a vendetta and he's gonna sail around looking for me. Not like I'm gonna get anything for it. Goldsman says the ghost curse though is a special emote to show how lazy ghosts really are. Is that the same ship even? Yep. He's changing his sails. He's on board. Or is he? Is that just the game loading the sails? Oh, he's on the Sovereign Dock. Uh, Alright, well, I'll just uh, swing over to Ancient Isle and then come back, I guess. Goldman says you can just sit in a chair as a ghost. Man, some people who play this game are so strange. They are so strange. Just absolutely bizarre. The things they decide to spend their time doing. And that comes from a guy who's just running boxes from port to port. Oh, here we go. Wow, that guy's a good shot, actually. Oh, that one didn't work. just got lucky. Well, up, up, and away, folks. Into another glorious sloop chase that we all love and adore. If I get caught, I get caught, like I said. This one was, uh, was what it was when it wasn't. Go fix that one tiny hole. Where is it? Where's the hole? I got a hole in here, right? Maybe not. 
Oh well. I guess not. Maybe it hit the mast. Check the mast. Mast, it hit the mast. Yep. Goldsman says it summons a ghostly form of the pirate lord's chair and your pirate just sits in it. Well, he be after you. Yep, he's coming for the crates now, I'll tell you what. Kind of close. This guy's probably one of those guys who's going to chase me around for, uh, you know, 60 minutes till I find a fog bank, so prepare yourselves for the riveting 40 minutes of action that we're going to witness. Would be nice if I could maneuver upwind instead of taking the crosswind, but hey, you get what you get sometimes. What side is he on? Directly behind me. Cool. Goldsman says I'm about to hop off and get some game of my own going. You have a good one, my friend. Yeah, you too, buddy. Thanks for stopping by. Always good to have a chat. That was uh, that was good. Like I said, I'm going to be uh, reading about astrophysics and stuff all tomorrow, probably. Got my interest peaked again. So you have yourself a good one. Me, I am going to perform a daring maneuver. A daring maneuver that nobody expects ever. Behold. Straight that out. Crank it left. I'm gonna use Kraken's fall. I'm sorry, Kraken's fall. A little bit of a slingshot maneuver. Put the island between me and him so that I can change heading to the west by northwest and sail up a wind. Oh, here it comes. How much distance is he going to get? We'll see. We'll see how things go. I'm so uh, absolutely deprived of sleep and all other things that, um, hey, things go the way they go. What was this guy as well? Because I figure, like, uh, usually when you say don't forget to like and subscribe, maybe he decided to, uh, to hop on Twitch and see if he could snipe me, but. This will be great. Perfect. Blunder bombs ready. Cook some meat. Of course I forgot to cook all the meat. But we're sailing into the wind now, so literally uh literally nothing. Literally nothing doing, ladies and gentlemen. This is it. Close, but uh, there will be no cigar. is a little bit of a uh... ah well he's right behind me so it's not going to make that much of a difference but we'll see usually if they're off to one side or another you can snag them 
This guy's pretty close, though. And he is uh, directly behind me at this point, so. Dark says, did you try Bannerlord yet in high? I was gonna today, didn't have a chance though. Like I said, I did play through the uh, tutorial though. You can consider this. This is like directly behind me. Zorak says, what did I walk in on? Oh, nothing. Shot some fireworks at a guy, the usual. He didn't like it, so now he's trying to... Uh, Trying to sloop a dupe in on me. Think I can squeeze through that? Probably not, hey. I'm gonna try it. Oh! At me with the chain of the shot. That can angle, I think that's probably his Hail Mary. Oh no, he's still going. Just doing another sloop chase, my friend. You know how much I love these. The absolute bread and butter of my joy. Now I turn this way, gonna cut through Shipwreck Bay. He'll be on my left flank. I'll snag him on one of these rocks. We'll see what kind of, uh, yep, yeah, he's on the left now. Gotta get this heading uh, straighter than this, though. See what side he decides to cut to. Jeez, come on, Hogwild. The more I zigzag, the more he's going to uh, catch up a little bit here. Oh, he's sailing off to that direction. Is he done? Oh, he's on board, isn't he? Ah, son of a bitch. I didn't hear, uh, I didn't hear a lot of things. I didn't hear the, uh, the shot when he shot over. But hey, that's, uh, that's kind of what I predicted for the start of this one. So, hey, you can't win them all. We'll see when I spawn in. I'll probably be toast, though. Obviously, my nerves are shot today, it being Sunday. But I'll do my best, folks. I'll do my best. Yeah, we're on fire. All right. Let's see what we can do here. Can't believe I missed that, uh, the sound of him shooting over, though. Sounds like he's dead, right? Not the raw chicken. Not the buttons I'm looking for. Fuck. <laughs> Not bad, though. Not a bad effort. I hate the way that, like, when you bind your food to a button, it still brings up the raw meat first.
on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Don't give me the raw meat. Oh, for fuck's sakes. My flag, uh, my sails are down anyway, so at least I'm moving. Zerark says, how did this happen? Well, you want to uh, hear the very start of the story? I didn't get any sleep. Then I didn't get any sleep again. Now we're here. Um, I just had a guy uh, follow me. I guess they, uh, I don't know whether it was a sword lunge off the island or whether he shot the, the cannon to board, but I just didn't hear it. I'm like, obviously not in my game today. So, that's that, but. But my sails are down and my anchor is up, so depending on where that other sloop ended up, I didn't see him around, but I might maybe still be in this. Sounds like we're going down, though, folks. Sounds like we're going down. Luckily, all the water in the bilge will be there, so I can, you know. Dark says he had in the run. Yeah, buddy, I'm going to uh, get a good night's sleep tonight. I uh, wasn't even going to stream tonight, but I decided to come out anyways because I enjoyed doing these. And, well, you can't win them all. It's a pretty glorious end anyways. Haven't had uh, one of these in a long time, like I said. I've only been boarded three times out of like 30 runs, so... Only my loading times were a little bit little bit quicker. Zarak says good night. Good night to you, my friend. Thanks for stopping by. Always good to, good to hear you. Good, always good to hear from you. I'm just like, load the game. Load the game. Zorak says, get some sleep, I will. Absolutely. Oh, this is so, oh, this is so disappointing. When you need the load, it just doesn't. I'm underwater now. Is there some sort of like uh, connection to this? How when it's like when your ship's sinking, the game takes an extra 30 seconds to load in? I don't know, but I guess I'm under. Ah, oh, well, that was a good run, had some good chats. It's always good to uh, hear from people and whatnot, so there you go. You can hear me drowning, but the game's not like loaded in for me to bucket my ship oh what a disappointment what a disappointment like where am I oh I'm just like okay yeah that's cool thanks a lot see at these really appreciate that look at all that loot eh that is so disappointing so uh, if anybody's watching this, I do have a donation link on Twitch if you want to give me like $700 so I can buy an, uh, an Xbox Series X and improve my load times. Good grief. That is just so unbelievable the way that that works. It's like when your ship's on fire and you need to bail water, it's going to take 45 seconds for you to get back in. So anyways, whatever. You know, you get some, uh, you get some wins, you get some losses sometimes. I'm... Um, Still pretty uh, pretty far ahead of things here. I'm going to check the book, see what we actually did make. So, uh, 954, you know what? I'm just going to write this one off because we didn't make a profit. I was at uh, 990, so whatever's in the books is no good. Captain Doby says, wow, the game just sank you. That's absolutely disgusting. Thanks, Doby. I appreciate it. Uh, I sank myself, I guess. Captain Doby says, yet the first respawn with zero holes worked just fine. Yeah, a little tough for me not to uh, be frustrated right now, but like... It is what it is, man. If you're still using uh, an Xbox One, like I am, then um, this is what we get. When your ship's got holes in it and it's on fire, yeah, you're just not going to be able to spawn back into the game. So, so really, you got to just like do better on the first try. That was my problem. I, uh, I got him. Got him on the second try. But the first one, it was like I went to grab the blunder bomb and my chicken came up because of my slippery fingers and everything. But anyways, I wasn't... Uh, I was going to take the night off, so... We're uh, two hours, 24 minutes into it, and I'm just going to uh, to call it here. Going to call it here. Going to get a good night's sleep, so it was fun. Fun coming out. Had some good chats. It was a uh, decent, uh, decent stream anyways. Like I said, I checked the book, but we're like 40K behind, so anything in the book, is uh, it's not going to be profitable anyways. But that's that. I mean, I'll tell you what. I will do one thing. I'll check the book. That'll be sync number eight on stream. My biggest disappointment, I don't know if it's because of the sleep depth or what, but 
I didn't hear the uh, the cannon shot when he shot over. I heard them shooting the chain shot, all the shots of the chain shot the first time, and then he was behind me, and suddenly he's, I heard the mermaid, and he was on the ship, and I did not hear the uh, shot to watch the ladders with the blunderbuss, and like, I'm incredibly disappointed in myself right now, but furthermore, if I check the footage and there's no, uh, like, I didn't hear the cannon. If the cannon just wasn't there, then, like, I, I don't know whether to be more disappointed or less disappointed. Because it's just, like, when the game just doesn't work, then you can only do what you're going to do. All I can do, I guess, is just uh, just practice more. But, again, you know, if there's no, if I can't hear the cannon shot, I can't watch the ladders. So that's that. 13 million gold earned. There it is. And we're sitting at... We're sitting at eight sinks. That'll be sink number eight. Of course, I sailed around that island six times and like shot uh, shot cannonballs at them too. I could have just left, but I didn't because I thought, you know, I don't know. Goldsman, you're absolutely wrong. That was not a friendly ship. People who have uh, guardians of fortune, like I said, they're not good people. So there you go. And uh, checking out on here. Captain Dolby says, I'd be disappointed with the game. You killed the guy, and that was recovery. Yeah, thanks that. Thanks for that and everything, but... When I'm on an Xbox One, there's absolutely no room for mistakes. And I made a couple, so this is where we're at. Time sunk eight times. There you go. Captain Dolby says, maybe could have extinguished the capstan first, but it's... Oh, jeez, I didn't even think about that. I should have eaten the chicken, because that's the, that's the reason I died. I forgot it was because of the fire, man. I went to uh, eat that piece of pork and I died by a split second. That is so unbelievably disappointing. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyways, so I'm uh, I'm super hog wild. <laughs> That's the end of run uh, number 30. I'm taking tomorrow off as I always do. I will be back. Uh, I'll be back Tuesday for our, our regular scheduled run, run number 31 at um, 9 p.m. Eastern as we always do it. So, you know. Always listen for that cannon and uh, make sure that you have the uh, latest, greatest hardware. Or else this is uh, the problems you're going to get into or something. I don't know, whatever. I could put a positive spin on it, but that was just absolutely. Captain Doby says, Ken gets screwed like that on PC too, so it's not console exclusive. Yeah. It's just such a, it's, it's such a strange situation, you know, because it used to be back in the day, every time uh, your respawn was that long, but now it's like, whether you spawn in or not seems kind of like a roll of the dice, and that's almost worse. But maybe it's not. I don't know. Whatever. It is what it is. Um, I'll be back Tuesday. Tuesday at 9 p.m. I would switch over. We'd shoot some cannonballs at random people, but like I said, I was uh, sleep deprived and everything to begin with. So, uh, so that's that. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna just take the night off and just chill out, chill out, get an early rest and all that. So, thanks for everybody who stopped by on the live so show. <laughs> And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. Really appreciate uh, the views, appreciate the support, all that stuff so far. So, hey, you know, you can't win them all. You can't win them all, but, but uh, that was an extraordinary disappointment to me anyways. So, so that's that. Catch you all on Tuesday. And uh, farewell for now, everybody.